Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar from OpenRex Group on COVID apps, success or failure in UK and Ireland. We're joined today by academics, activists from across um, the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland to discuss our government's respective government's response to COVID-19 um, and most importantly, the COVID apps that have been released over the past few months. My name is Matthew Rice. I'm the Scotland Director for Open Rights Group. We're a digital rights campaigning organisation uh, working across the United Kingdom to protect uh, the right to privacy and freedom of expression online. COVID-19 has, at the risk of going into cliche, uh, presented a huge challenge for many of our public health systems. One challenge in particular has been the ability to actually trace the spread of the virus. Various governments have tried different methods, some of which have included using the national surveillance infrastructure, such as in Israel, or adopting wearables um, for their citizens to use and wear, as in Singapore, to trace the proximity of individuals. The need for this stems from the fact that what we're facing is, of course, a disease that is incredibly infectious, but also can be spread without um, much awareness. And those many of those who receive it um, do not show symptoms. And though although some that do receive it, uh, it can be deadly to you. So we're in this incredibly difficult position where there's a very infectious disease spreading across our countries um, and we're not quite sure how to track it. Our traditional manual contact tracing systems that have been in place for all kinds of infectious diseases are not fit for the task. Um, and so governments have had to work hard to adopt different measures. For all of the governments um, in this call, um, for the UK and Republic of Ireland, they have opted to adopt a smartphone-based proximity app, more of which we'll hear from the kind of underlying technology from panelists such as Stephen Farrell. What we want to do today is explore both the technology that sits behind this, whether or not it can be, whether it's effective and whether it can be trusted, basically, um, but also importantly discussing whether or not the governments, our governments' respective rollouts had been a success or a failure. So we have an underlying technology um, and each of the apps do different things at, at, in different ways also. And so we need to be able to understand both the technical understanding, but also the social underpinnings that takes place here. And so to do that, we've, uh, brought together a number of panelists uh, from across uh, civil society and academia to, to address these questions. We have Stephen Farrell, who is uh, from Trinity College Dublin, who will be uh, discussing his own technical research on COVID proximity tracing applications, giving us an understanding and a technical underpinning of how these operations, of how these systems work. We have uh, Olga Cronin from the Irish Council, for civil liberties, um, who'll be discussing the, uh, their concerns and the uh, Republic of Ireland's rollout. Uh, Patrick Corrigan uh, from Amnesty International Northern Ireland. Uh, you have myself, Matthew Rice, um, as Scotland Director, reflecting on Scotland. And then hopefully uh, we will have Lillian Edwards um, from Newcastle University joining us um, very shortly. So at the moment, uh, You've, most of you have been very helpful in telling us when our uh, cameras have been on, so you've all quite easily figured out the questions and chat function tools. Um, you won't be able to um, speak uh, during the during the broadcast. We will pick out some of the questions that you're asking um, and point them towards the panelists. Uh, none of your uh, webcams will be switched on. My webcam isn't switched on either because it's broken for some reason, but that's a long story will have to be addressed another day. Hopefully we'll be able to cover all the ground um, of this really, really important and really fascinating topic. So first off, what I'd like to do is turn to Stephen Farrell, who will be able to give us a bit of an underpinning of the uh, technical understanding and under, uh, of the COVID tracker apps, in particular, the Google Apple exposure notifications. So Stephen is a research fellow in the School of Computer Science and Statistics at Trinity College Dublin, where he teaches and researches on security, privacy, and delayed disruption tolerant networking. Stephen is currently a member of the Internet Architecture Board and is a co-founder of Tolerant Networks Limited, a TCT campus company. 
Since March 2020, Stephen and colleague Doug Leith have been investigating the efficacy, security, and privacy characteristics of COVID-19 tracking apps. So, Stephen, uh, I'll hand it over to you while I also pull up um, Pascal to present your slide that you passed. So, over to you, Stephen. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, let me know if the audio is imperfect in any way, uh, other than my accent, which is the normal way it's imperfect. Um, so, I think I have one slide to kind of that's going to pop up in a minute. Um, there you go. Um, yeah. So. Uh, as was said, myself and my colleague Doug Leith have been working on this since uh, around about March. And we, we have been running a little project we call TACT. Uh, there's a link in the bottom of that slide you're more than welcome to look at. And our starting point really was to not to be a proponent of any of these technologies, but and, or nor, nor a, against them necessarily, but just to kind of try and see how they work, do they work, are there privacy or security issues associated with them. Um, so basically since then we've been uh, testing what people, what other people are proposing, and then trying to publish results as we find them. Uh, so initially, we we had a look at the Singapore Trace Together app that, uh, and then was subsequently used in uh, also in Australia. Uh, but then more recently, the Google Apple exposure notification system is kind of what's getting traction in a lot of places, I think, and, and certainly is what's been deployed in the UK and Ireland. Uh, so it's again more relevant, and I'll kind of limit myself to talk about it for the rest of the few minutes I have. Uh, so I guess probably some people know all about this stuff, some people maybe know less, so it's probably worth just covering briefly how it kind of works or how it attempts to work. Um, essentially Google and Apple have agreed um, on a way in which, uh, which a relatively privacy friendly way uh, of being able to kind of attempt to detect if somebody was nearby who, uh, at some point in the past, let's say two weeks, uh, who subsequently turns out to test positive for COVID. So the model basically is that uh, the, the, the each region, so that could be uh, England and Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, um, so or in the in the United States, for example, it's at a state level. Typically, each region operates a server and then has an app that's more or less um, tailored for that region. And everybody, they, the regional government or public health authorities, try and get everybody to install the app if they can. And the way the app works essentially is if, every, if everybody's running it or if two people nearby one another are running it, the app is sending out Bluetooth big beacons, so sing, signals it sends out about four times a second. And those are very random looking things. Uh, they're not easy to kind of correlate or use to track people with. And it, it, essentially any phone that you're nearby, if you're both running the app, you'll, if you'll exchange these random numbers. And then if subsequently one of you tests positive for COVID, then as part of the integration of the app with the health service or as part of the manual contact tracing, the, the app will be triggered on your phone if you test tested positive to upload a bunch of cryptographic values, which would allow all the other phones you've been nearby to kind of recover that fact from the random things that are exchanged. So I won't go into the cryptography today here, but it, it seems to work uh, at a cryptographic protocol level. Um, and uh, again, everybody we've worked with on this, uh, I think, is kind of well-intentioned, uh, but there are some things to say about it. So um, the, the kind of epidemiological requirements that's handed to the engineers here seems to be to say, uh, in most places, wear these two uh, handsets within two meters for more than 15 minutes, minutes uh, or not. And the 15 minutes part is relatively straightforward. Uh, however, Bluetooth is a radio technology that's in, not intended for measuring distance. It's intended for connecting to your, your headphones or a speaker fucking or whatever. Fucking... I heard somebody, somebody else's audio sharing. It. Great. Uh, anyway, so uh, Bluetooth is intended for, for sending packets. It's not intended for measuring distance. And the way you can think about trying to measure distance with Bluetooth essentially is the further away you are in a, in a, in a perfect world, the further away the two devices are, the, the, the weaker the signal would be. And that, I think, however, gets complicated. And, and my, my own personal opinion is that while, it, while this, these systems can work, they, I don't believe they can work very reliably. And it's unclear how reliable it will be in the end. That's caused by three factors. One is the, 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 the vast number of different types of handsets. There's roughly about 25,000 different Android handset types now, most places in the world, there's only a few that are really important. Uh, so basically, I was, I was trying to explain why I think the reliable detection of two meters distance is, is, is tricky, challenging. 
there's three reasons. One is there's about 25,000 different Android handset types. It's a little bit easier for Apple because they can they have you know tighter control on their own hardware. But for Google, it's a real challenge. To, um, the, the problem is with those different handset types, the radio antennas are, are differently installed and differently laid out inside the, the, the handset. Um, usually as a little uh, you know, wire that's, that's strung around the outside of the circuit board inside. But it's different from handset to handset. And the result there is when we did some tests, uh, you can get false negatives even at a one meter distance. Um, now that I think will improve over time. But it's a big challenge to get, uh, essentially it requires you to calibrate device types and getting you know, all of the range of device types in our, that are deployed calibrated is a big challenge. But that might improve over time and, and get a bit better. There's another challenge though, uh, which is uh, phones don't always, uh, they're not always sitting in an ideal environment. Typically somebody might have a phone in a bag, in a, in a, in a pocket, could be a front pocket, could be a back pocket. And that all also affects the signal strength as received by the other phone. So in a bunch of tests we did, uh, if you have a phone in your back pocket, it might essentially, you know, and, and the person is in front of you who has the other phone, your body will absorb some of the radio signal, uh, not in a damaging way, just, just fine, but it will weaken the signal in a way that might make you appear further away than you are. So it looks like between the, uh, in the measurements we've done, between the variation in handset types and the, the positioning and orientation and uh, whether the phone is in a pocket or a bag or whatever, that kind of adds enough noise that false negatives become relatively, possibly relatively common. And it's, it, it's unknown to what stage they're common. And obviously those false negatives would, would result in you not getting a notification when you possibly should. So I think that's a challenge. We also did some tests in, in a bus and in a tram. And they, these, this has a similar issue that you get the false negatives because somebody has the phone in their pocket, et cetera, as before. But the difference is in a bus and a tram, it's kind of a metal tube environment. So the radio signals bounce off of the, the walls, ceilings, uh, and floors, and so on. And that can cause false positives as well. Uh, so in the test we did in the tram that we published results of, we saw uh, sometimes you'd get a false negative for somebody one meter away, and sometimes you get a false positive for somebody five meters away. And it's kind of random which happens. So that's a bit unfortunate for these apps because you'd imagine that public transport is one of the intended uh, scenarios where they should be useful and the, the metal environment uh, it basically makes it harder to do this reliable de detection of distance. So there's a bunch of challenges um, in tests we've done and in tests a few other people around the world have done. I don't think it's clear whether this, uh, it certainly is unclear that you can reliably detect whether you're within two meters or not. And it's, it, I'm not a, a medical type person so I don't even know is that the right question to be asking. It's possible there could be a better question to ask but the, the technology is more suited to answer. But at first, for the moment, if the question you're asking is, can I reliably detect if somebody's within two meters using Bluetooth? I think the answer is not always, definitely not always. Then looking at the security, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's it's inherent in, the, in these systems that are essentially broadcasting beacons that there's no real way to do that without avoiding uh, what we call a replay attack. And this is not a new attack we detected. This is a known thing from like 20 years ago in mobile ad hoc networking, where essentially the, the scenario that can happen is uh, somebody could implement more or less the same technology as you'd get in one of these apps, but let's say implemented on a Raspberry Pi. If you do that on two of those devices, what you can do essentially is put one in a scenario where somebody who later tests positive is likely to go by, let's say at a COVID testing station, and you put one there listening and picking up all the beacons from everybody who goes by and then repeating those by sending them over the internet to the second device which you might choose to locate somewhere like in a hospital emergency department where you you know because you're a bad person you might cause damage the net effect uh, we did a study on looking at the numbers back in may uh, based on the numbers going through our test center here in dublin and based on the numbers and the, the duration you expect people to hang around the hospital emergency department and it looked like you, for each real positive person going by per hour, you could probably cause four or more false positives uh, in the second location. Now, I don't, I don't believe anybody has, or to my knowledge, nobody has actually uh, tried to mount this replay attack, but it's possible and it's kind of not possible to really fix this. So you, there's a risk of it associated with doing this. Um, my expectation is that poss you know, if these if the whole situation goes on long enough, at some point somebody will do this somewhere in the world. Hopefully it won't be in, in, in anywhere in the British Isles and we'll all be happier. 
The next point uh, we noticed was uh, we had a look at the apps that are being distributed um, back in July. There was about seven or eight of them at that point. We kind of did some light kind of looking at the traffic they send and, and uh, playing with them on handsets. And most of the apps themselves were, were, were pretty clean. So a lot of the governments, uh, the health authorities who've written applications have, have kind of done a good job from a privacy and security perspective. There's a couple of things you might kind of criticize and say that one is a little bit better than another, but mostly they're pretty good. However, the overall system comes in kind of two parts. One is the app provided by the health authority, and the other is the handling of all the Bluetooth stuff and the cryptography uh, down inside the operating system, which is provided by Google or Apple. And that's kind of where the meat of all the system is implemented. And in tests we did on Android, we did no tests on, on, on Apple, but just for, because we didn't have time. In tests we did on Android, it, it turns out that the, uh, the implementation of the Google part on Android it has some privacy issues because it's essentially bundled with a thing called Google Play Services. And Google Play Services handles a whole bunch of other things to do with the operating system. Um, the issue here is uh, essentially, I think it's summarized this way. If you don't care about Google tracking you, there's no new issue here at all. If you do care about Google tracking you and you want to install one of these apps, that creates a, a new quandary for you as a person because prior to these apps, you could turn off Google Play Services and your phone would more or less still work. Very, very few people actually did that, but you could. Uh, once these apps come along, if you want to run that, you have to turn back on Google Play Services. And Google Play Services is pretty privacy unfriendly in that it calls home to Google uh, every six hours or so, telling it your phone number, the IMEI from the handset, the SIM serial number, there's something about the networks you've been connected to, et cetera. A lot of it's, it's pretty privacy unfriendly. And, and then again, there's, a, there's another callback about every 20 minutes that kind of links all those together. So, so again, on Android with the current Google implementation, there are, there's a new privacy issue for somebody who doesn't want Google tracking them, which makes it because the way Google implemented this means you can't run the app without running Google Play services, and Google Play services is pretty privacy unfriendly. Uh, almost my last point is uh, we're doing some measurement of what's going on for the last couple of months. Uh, we've been measuring the, the information published by a bunch of these systems and, and in different places. We're up to about 19 or 20 of them now. And essentially, I, I mentioned at the beginning, if somebody tests positive, they kind of upload some, some values to the, the health authority server, and then everybody else downloads those values and then can check, was I in proximity? So we can run scripts that download those values and pretend to be a phone and, and, and basically do some counting. And again, it's not a, it's not a privacy unfriendly thing. Um, that can be done essentially anonymously and without uh, exposing anybody to anything. But what it does allow us to do is count how many of these things are happening. And in some of the regions we're looking at, there is a kind of a shortfall. What we see is if you look at the population of a region and if you look at how many people have installed or are active users of the app, and if you look at how many cases are happening, you can kind of estimate how many people should have done this upload action. So if, for example, the app is deployed uh, at about 25% of the population, as I think may or may not be the case here in Ireland, then you'd expect if there's 100 cases, there should be about 25 uploads. And we don't see that. We see it varying from kind of, um, you know, in the worst case to where there's like a 95% shortfall, up to some that are pretty close, where it's maybe 10 or 15%. Which could be explained by lots of other factors. And I think the issue, what's this showing is that it's not trivial to integrate these app uh, systems into the back end, which also involves the manual contact tracing. It seems we don't know the causes of why we have these shortfalls, but they, they seem to be real um, and quite significant in some regions uh, where, you know, more than 50 or 60 or 70 percent of the expected number of uploads you should see, you just don't see. Um, so I think there's more to be, to be explored there to find out why might these things be happening. Are they fixable or are they just you know, problems that are, that are unavoidable? Uh, so I guess my summary is from our point of view, uh, I guess that's myself and Doug, uh, we think that it, these apps are being positioned as if they will help a lot in some places, as if you re everybody should be deploying them or, or installing them and using them. I would have been more comfortable with this if it was cast as a giant experiment, uh, because it's not clear if, if, if these things actually work effectively. Um, and you know, do they actually help with the, the contact tracing, or do they not really? Um, and I think the way you have to, it's a quite subtle measure to try and figure that out. Essentially what you have to do is think about the, the set of people 
who would not otherwise have been found by manual contact tracing, but who were notified by one of these apps. And of that set of people who got notified, how many of those turned out to be positive versus the, the, the average in the population at that time and place? So it's a very subtle kind of measure to, to figure out if these things are effective or not. And I don't think we'll know for a while, and it's possible we'll never know because uh, it's not clear that all of the people deploying these apps and services are making the kind of measurements that would allow them to tell in a while, are these, uh, is this effective and helping or is it just noise? Uh, and I'll leave that just for time. There's a link there at the bottom of the slides. We have published, I think, 10 reports, but three of those have been peer reviewed so far. These are just technical reports. Uh, and I'd be happy to take questions offline or, or later on. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Stephen. Um, we always have time for like at least one sort of follow up uh, point. Um, I'm just looking over the uh, questions asked. Um, Mark Don kind of makes a statement, but I wonder if it's a question that you'd want to um, weigh in on. If users could see how many devices were detected on each check, um, then they could see how accurate the distance estimates are. Um, and having would would that mean that it's having a visible distance estimate? Would that make it more helpful? Um, not sure I follow it. Um, so, so, okay, I guess I I'm, I'll, I'll interpret the question as as you know, could the apps make visible to users what they currently think is the um, the distance between two devices to improve increase the confidence of people in using these things? I, that's how I interpret the question. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you could try, but the problem is that. You, it's inherent in the protocol being privacy friendly that you, if there's two devices near you, you can tell which one of them is the one is, is is claimed to be so far away versus the other one. Now you can do tests obviously with individual pairs of devices, but it varies a lot. And my experience is that the the kind of limits that the apps use to detect kind of near versus far are about as far apart as the difference between the phone being in your hand in front of somebody and in your pocket. So in other words, it's not clear to me that you can kind of do this in a way that works very well. So that it, it's an interesting idea to have some kind of user interface to let people figure out their own themselves what they think about it. Um, we did some tests with people sitting around a, a dinner table and if the phones are in pockets below the level of the table, the signal strength is tiny and you'll be seen to be far away. If you put the phones on the table, it gets better but uh, again, depends on the handset type and, and the, 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 the material the table's made of and a bunch of things. So I'm not sure is the answer, uh, but it's an interesting idea. Great, perfect. Right, let's um, thank you very much, Stephen. And Stephen will be around, like you said, for questions that follow up um, and we'll try and make as much time as we can um, uh, for, for longer audience questions. But now I wanna to turn to um, Olga Croning um, from the uh, Irish Council for Civil Liberties, um, and she is a surveillance and human rights policy officer there. Um, I'm going to just make sure that Olga's uh, unmuted and Hi, take it away. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so my name is Olga Cronin and I'm a policy officer with the Irish Council for Civil Liberties and the, also the International Network for Civil Liberty Organisations. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Thanks a million, Matthew, for having us. Um, it's been almost three months now since the Irish app was launched in the first week of July um, with the announcement that it had a 72% accuracy rate. I should say that there was no explanation then and there has been no explanation since as to how that 72% accuracy rate was arrived at. But regardless, within 48 hours of its launch, um, the app was downloaded more than a million times. And within two weeks, the developers of the app, Nearform, announced that there had been 1.3 million downloads. Um, and they claimed that the figure represented more than 30% of people in Ireland with compatible devices. So those figures would indicate that there was a pretty warm public or reception rather for the app um, here while our Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, repeatedly referred to it as a very important weapon in our arsenal against COVID-19, somewhat con conjuring up images um, of our phones being some kind of weapons of, of virus destruction. Um, but as I said, we, we're three months on now and it's, it's definitely not clear to ICCL that this is the case. Um, that this is that this app is the weapon of virus destruction. I'd like to come back to the efficacy of the app, if I may, um, in a few moments, and also then maybe talk about ICCL's um, outstanding concerns. 
first of all, I'd like to talk about what ICCL has learned since the app was launched, um, apart from the fact that the, that the technology is very popular in Ireland, um, but also since it was first mooted in the press um, as something that the government was planning on launching back in March of this year. Um, not long after those press reports, ICCL, along with Digital Rights Ireland and other privacy and data protection experts, discussed what we knew about the app and what we didn't know. Um, we subsequently engaged with the health service, um, with our health service executive, the HSC and the Department of Health, um, by first writing and publishing a letter in April calling on the government to be as transparent as possible, to publish the app's data protection impact assessment and source code, um, so that we could, so that it would allow for independent expert scrutiny by people like Steve, like um, Dr. Farrell and Professor Professor Leith. Um, that letter attracted both media and political attention with our requests being raised in our parliament. About a month after that, um, the group then published a set of nine principles, which we stated must be followed when the government um, implements new technologies in order to ensure that, that, that this technology would align with human rights requirements and protects our privacy. These principles included things like ensuring that any piece of new technology would be effective, have a clear limited purpose and be a necessary and proportionate response to a problem. Um, this led to an invitation to meet with our Minister for Health and raise our concerns with him. We were told that the DPIA and source code would be published and that we would be given time to examine it, all that material ahead of the, the app's launch. And we were also invited to make a submission to the Special 19 um, Parliamentary Committee here in Ireland specifically about the app. That committee, committee was later told that the Department of Health was confident that our principles were observed. So true to the word, the HSE and the Department of Health subsequently did publish a large amount of documents on GitHub, um, including the DPIA and source code, and even the feedback that they had got from the Data Protection Commission when the Data Protection Commission had looked at, their, at the DPIA. So this was a kind of an unprecedented move in Ireland. You know, some, such steps towards transparency are really quite unheard of here. So it was great to see, and it really um, set the standard for the future. Um, we subsequently examined all of that material and basically compared that with the, the principled framework that we had published earlier. And then we gave the app a score, a score of uh, C+. So within that report card, if you like, we gave an individual score for each principle. So for example, in terms of the principles that a new piece of technology would have to have a clear and limited purpose, we gave it a D. In terms of um, uh, at the grade for the principle of necessity and proportionality, we also gave it a D, and for the principle of effectiveness, we also gave it a D. So those D grades really essentially dragged down the overall grade of the app. And what was at the heart of that, of each of those um, grades, really was the lack of evidence that these apps do what they say they, they do. And really, this is kind of, you know, echoing what Dr. Farrell has just laid out there as to. Um, the unre unreliability of, 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 these, of this technology to do what they're saying it sh should do and can do. Um, throughout the entire period, um, from March until that point, as Dr. Farrell was saying, they were prolifically testing these apps and finding little evidence that they worked. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we could not see any basis for the 72% accuracy rate that we were quoted and which was, you know, said to journalists and members of the public by the health authorities. So the app was maybe launched, was launched maybe a week after we um, issued that report card. Um, and as I pointed out earlier, the app went on to be downloaded by many, many people. The whole process to that point taught us that, you know, steps taken by the HSE and the Department of Health before they launched the app, you know, serve as an example of good practice and transparency by the government. You know, they responded to calls for transparency, they engaged with NGOs such as ICCL, they implemented key principles highlighted by us, and they made documents concerning the app publicly available and open to scrutiny. So, so now we know that government can be transparent and it serves them well to do so, given the buy-in that the app has experienced. But this doesn't mean that ICCL's concerns about the app have disappeared. During this whole time, we've also learned that while our authorities, as I just outlined, are subject to the data protection impact assessment um, process and governance and can be held accountable to a certain degree, the big tech element underlying the app, as just explained by Dr. Farrell um, earlier, really highlights how these apps are not just what we see in our phones, the apps are part of the Google Apple ecosystem that really is known to gather troubling amounts of personal data. 
So, uh, and particularly in the Android element of the of the Android um, version of the app. So, unlike the process that the HSE and department went through in terms of transparency, the the Google the, the game API is is not open source. We would say there's not enough public documentation about it, and there's almost no public information on the nature of the updates. And this naturally leads to the question: What's the point of the Irish government? And indeed, other governments, um, their rigorous approach to transparency in regards to the app, if the big tech framework housing the app isn't subjected to the same or isn't subject to the same scrutiny or governance, like why is there a difference in, difference in standards if they're both contributing to the same app? And you know, many people will say that, oh, it's just Google and Apple, and we know this happens, doesn't matter, this is their world and we're just living in it. Again, reiterating, reiterating what um, Dr. Farrell just said, you know, some people just won't care. But we would care um, and we would disagree with that because this is a piece of technology um, that the Irish government and other governments are actively asking their entire populations to download and use. This is an unprecedented step by our government at least and, and it really it, it serves only to further embed and entrench big tech in a health surveillance system that previously didn't exist. So we have to ask ourselves what we want our new normal to look like. Um, since the launch of our app, our Minister for Health has indicated that Google and Apple will be used in future health tech services. So if this is the beginning of some kind of long-term relationship that our state is going to embark on with big tech, we believe, at least from our ICCL's point of view, that we should be cautious and vigilant from the get-go. Um, and we believe that the, the public deserves to know how their personal data is being processed and for what purposes. In terms of I suppose the success of the app or its efficacy, which is really the basis of whether these apps should or should not be used. As Dr. Farrell just pointed out, it's still very clear to, to all of us, I think, how effective this, this type of technology has been in assisting the state's contact tracing system. The latest figures that we have from the HSE show that there are approximately 1.28 million users of the app in Ireland, but we know it was deleted by 500,000 users since its launch for various reasons i think and um, there was a battery issue for a while and other things it's not known how many people just you know re-downloaded it but what we do have that figure and um, over 650 people who have tested positive has shared their random ids and that and this has resulted in 1200 exposure alerts and then we've also been told that of that cohort of 1200 alerts some quote unquote of those went on to test positive so we would say that that information isn't adequate um it, like you know it doesn't really give us a clear indication of how effective that app is like how many is some you know is that two or is that 200 is it a thousand you know could the proportion of people who later tested positive have been traced by any other means were they definitely traced more quickly by the app than human contact tracing it's is the figure for the number of people who received you know, exposure alerts really an accurate measure of effectiveness or success. We don't, we don't think so. At least ICCL doesn't doesn't believe it is. You know, for example, it was reported just two weeks ago that a secondary school here in Ireland, in County Louth, had to close its doors to more than 1,200 of its um, students. Sorry, more than half of its 1,200 students. After more than 30 of the teachers, the school teachers received uh, an alert via the app telling them that they had been in close contact of a COVID positive case. So a lot of confusion ensued and, you know, some teachers were getting tested and others were being told that they didn't have to get tested um, and that they were free to teach. But it was reported that following an assessment of the situation, public health officials kind of came in and said, you know, that teachers or some of the teachers at least contacted by the app were not close contacts at all. So you know, this is a situation that le then led to the Association of Secondary, oh, sorry, the President of the Association of Secondary Teachers here in Ireland, ASTI, um, calling for clarity around the app because I suppose you can imagine the, the kind of confusion and possible chaos that could occur if such a situation was multiplied um, several times across the country. So we're still trying to establish exactly how the health authorities plan to measure the effectiveness of the app. And um, in terms of our concerns, in a nutshell, our main remaining concerns and questions about the app relate to uh, efficacy. Um, the second one being the big tech element and the lack of oversight or governance there compared to what state authorities have to or are subjected to. And then the final one would be the issue of how this kind of tech does lead to normalising surveillance. 
On the latter point, just on Tuesday gone by, the Irish Times newspaper here reported that Ireland's app may be linked with those of Germany and Italy within weeks in order to allow for easier and safer travel between EU countries during the pandemic. With a European, sorry, with a European Commission official telling a journalist that such a move should make travel easier, it was reported that this is part of efforts to restart free movement across the continent. It's probably worth noting that when the Northern Irish app was launched, Nearform did say that they hoped their app would become a blueprint, eventually syncing up all of Europe. ICCL would have concerns that any such moves would serve as a potential example of mission creep in a situation where an app you know, is currently voluntary, could become mandatory to, assert, to access certain services, such as a flight. It could also encourage others, such as employers or transport providers or stores or clubs, sporting clubs, to require the use of similar technologies without the benefit of rigorous scrutiny or the protection of privacy. So, you know, to think of such moves, to think that such moves could possibly be made or rushed out when legitimate concerns remain about the technology's efficacy, we would say is concerning. Over the past number of months, we've heard the phrase, you know, perfection is the enemy of the good in terms of trying to get things back to normal as, as quickly as possible. But there's also another phrase worth considering, especially when we really, you know, need to think about what we want our new normal to look like, and that's act in haste, repent at leisure. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Olga. Um, uh, I'm not seeing any Im immediate like follow-up questions that are coming in. What actually one follow-up had been? I mean, we'll touch on it perhaps in, from the UK perspective. The effect of kind of regulators and institutions. The DPC. You'd said the DPC had come in and made strong points to um, the developers. And that actually may have had an effect on some of the further development, of course, because Nearform had a role to play in Scotland's development. How would you have, how would you rate the DPC's role in kind of scrutinising and pointing out some of the errors that may have existed in, in, in an earlier version of the development? Did they perform well? Uh, that's a good question, Matthew. Um, I think I think they did perform well. I think they performed. I think they were fair. Um, and I thought it was, I suppose there was two things that stood out for me from the Data Protection Commissioner's review. One was that they recognised and they said, you know, you guys are saying that this will speed up contact tracing, this will help contact um, manual contact tracing, and this will help curb the transmission of COVID-19. And the DPC was very clear saying that's not proven. And, uh, you know, I, I just thought that that was a significant um, marker to put down and also there's another element to the Irish app that I know is not in all of our apps which is the symptom tracker element um, so in the Irish app you can basically ask yourself how you're feeling <laughs> and update it on the app you know you're so you're asked do you feel good do you feel bad um, and it's it's kind of they, they call it syn syndromic surveillance and the idea is that it's this kind of anonymous um, syndromic surveillance. The information is passed back to the central statistics office. And then from there, there's some sort of statistical analysis. And then it's supposed to go back to like our public authorities. And they're supposed to use that to detect outbreaks or predict outbreaks. And, you know, I suppose, uh, respond to the movement of the virus. We haven't seen any evidence of how that data has been used or if it's been in any way effective and it's really hard to imagine that it is effective given that it is just it's self-assessment it's completely subjective so um and then sorry so just go back to the data protection commissioner they did say in relation to that element of the app that it should be disbanded if it's not found to be effective and it, this is one thing that we had highlighted very early on because the european data protection board's own guidelines in terms of these co contact tracing apps when they, I think it was April, they initially, they, um, it was April, they launched a series of guidelines about these contact tracing apps and said that contact tracing apps should have one and one purpose and one purpose only, and that's contact tracing. So we were arguing that the symptom tracker element should be um, disbanded, but it, it went ahead. So I think the DPC did a, a fair job. Great, great. Um, thank you so much, and we'll come back um, to the to the wider discussions later on. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Patrick Corrigan, um, who is the Programme Director and Head of Nations and Regions at Amnesty International UK. Um, 
Patrick, uh, do you want to lead us off on your perspectives? I think you're muted at the moment, actually. Let's see. That's peculiar. Okay, I think that's good. Um, yeah, thanks, gonna... Matt, uh, and to Open Rights Group for the invitation to participate in this. And, uh, and it's been great to engage with you over the last number of months on this area where you have specific expertise that certainly in our office of Amnesty we wouldn't have. So that's been much appreciated. I mean, it's quite a sort of a serious afternoon uh, in Northern Ireland around the, the COVID situation at the moment. We just this afternoon had news of um, a record number of COVID infections in the last 24 hours, 934. That's more than double uh, the number in any in any 24 hour period uh, since they started this testing model. Um, so it's clear that whatever can be done in terms of sort of uh, testing and tracing and self isolation uh, is really important. Um, and as with the question then is whether or not the app that has been deployed in Northern Ireland helps fulfil that purpose. Back in April, beginning of May, when a uh, tracing app was being floated, um, and in particular, uh, the NHS X app, uh, that uh, centralized, less privacy protecting model that was being uh, developed and piloted in the Isle of Wight uh, by the NHS or by companies associated with the NHS um, was, was underway. Uh, we had very serious concerns in Amnesty generally across the UK, um, certainly in Northern Ireland, if that was going to be the app either specifically or the same approach to the, of that app, that centralised approach uh, would be deployed in Northern Ireland. And that's what prompted us at that time to write to our health minister and to the Northern Ireland Assembly Health Committee, the Scrutiny Committee, raising our concerns, a similar set of data privacy and human rights concerns that ICCL and others would have raised in the Republic. Um, and on top of on top of those concerns, we also had an issue around interoperability, and so particularly the cross-border uh, aspect in Ireland for many people's daily lives in Northern Ireland, being able to crisscross the border for education, shopping, work. It's just a normal part of daily life. And so it would be important going forward uh, for any app uh, that was going to be deployed, not just to be human rights, data privacy protecting, but also to be effective on both sides of the border. So I suppose it's maybe a slightly different way of looking at it than the way Olga has presented. And it was Amnesty made clear from the start that we uh, could agree in principle with an app playing part of that test and trace system uh, that we wanted to play our part in sort of the, the upholding of fundamental human rights, including uh, the right to health, but that the data privacy and other such rights uh, had to also be at the heart of what was being promoted here. And I think initially we were concerned that the response, we didn't get a response from the health minister for some time. Um, and when he was soon after uh, up in front of the health committee, he talked in a way that was unclear about what his intentions were. He seemed to have a sort of a laissez-faire approach to the NHS X app being made available and being downloaded in Northern Ireland, uh, perhaps at a time when there wouldn't have been a Northern Ireland app developed, a bespoke app for here uh, that might take a different approach. And so there was a concern that we were going to end up uh, in, a, in a very troubling uh, position with regard to app use around the data privacy issues, but also around interoperability because the NHSX app that was being developed at that stage uh, was a very was totally different model to that that we, we knew then was being developed in the Republic. And I think we, we raised our concerns in the media at that time, and I, I'm not sure that went down particularly well in the Department of Health here, because uh, when there was, as Olga, Olga has touched upon it, as sort of this rapid move to deploy all sorts of, of uh, approaches to uh, uh, to pushing back on COVID and that uh, there was a, was a time when there wasn't too much scrutiny going on and things were being uh, nodded through in our assembly and other legislatures as well. But I think then um, we detected a, a change in position and the Department of Health then did accept the need for a privacy protection um, and for interoperability. And I think they bought into the idea then of, I think of, of looking closely at what was happening in the Republic of Ireland. And, and over the summer, 
uh, they made arrangements to to commission Nearform, the same developer as had developed the, the app in the Republic, to develop a similar app for Northern Ireland. And they started to engage with Amnesty, with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and with other sort of stakeholder groups. And we were we were very pleased with the level of engagement um, afterwards. And from that point onwards, that they that they did hear what we were saying, and uh, they were they were dealing with the information commissioner's office at the same time and setting out their proposals. Um, and there was a backward and forward dialogue, both through correspondence and through a number of these sort of like stakeholder meetings, where where Amnesty and other groups were airing similar concerns. They were hearing them, they were responding to them, and we had access to. Uh, really, the key officials, the the data, uh, sort of the digital uh, sort of tech leads, as well as the public health leads on this, and uh, we got to a point then um, where they they met, broadly speaking, all of the tests that we had set down for them uh, some months earlier, um, and I think the stakeholder groups got to a point where where we were to varying degrees content uh, with what was now on offer just before it went available for the public to download and it, it went on the on the app stores uh, I think at the end of July and so I suppose we're, we're a couple of months into that but it was just around the time that it was being made available so there was a bit of a rush at that late July period when we were meeting with them and they were sharing documents um, the DPIA code uh, and the source code, for instance, but also they'd set up uh, an expert oversight group with academics from tech academics from Ulster University and Queen's University Belfast to oversee the tech aspects that were certainly beyond my level or most of the local groups level of expertise, but to check that the commitments that were being given to us uh, were being met um, and that it it was this and I think what we ended up with is what they describe as and we accept as like a, a minimal a minimum viable product i.e it was really doing uh, two jobs proximity detection and exposure notification and I think was actually slightly stripped down compared to the model released in the Republic of Ireland and I think it may have been that symptom tracker um, product uh, that wasn't in R1, so um, so that was the product that went on the market. Um, we we were willing to give that uh, sort of to, to say publicly that we were happy with the level of engagement that we'd had and that 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 our tests had broadly speaking been met. Um, that's not to say all of our concerns are set aside, and I think the the concerns, particularly that Olga and, and before her Stephen set out about um, was about big tech and that that the the state has had to subcontract its approach to these big these tech behemoths um and that we're now bought into that for the future is of course of concern uh, because what what they may be able to reassure now um around data privacy may not be the case in the future and it may be that we we or the state gets too too far in uh, in terms of that relationship um i suppose in terms of take up um as it has been promoted here by advertising. Take up as of Wednesday, uh, for information from the our health minister would say almost 400,000 people have downloaded it in the two months uh, since it was made available. That's roughly a quarter of the adult population in Northern Ireland. Um, just yesterday, they launched a, a revised updated version of it, which is, has been uh, designed or made available now, extended availability to 11 to 17 year olds. It was only 18 years and up before. That's after a process they have gone through with the information come up, the, the ICO, the Northern Ireland Children and Young Persons Commissioner and the Children's Law Centre, a children's rights group here who have engaged with them and that they, I think, have given essentially the, their blessing to, to this model being promoted now to, to younger people, to, to, to teenage school children. Um, they, the, in terms of the numbers coming back, we don't have a lot of data on that, but what uh, the Health Minister uh, said publicly on Wednesday was that uh, 3,735 people have received exposure notifications and have been asked to self-isolate. Um, whether that is a, a good rate, a bad rate, I, I don't know. And I think it's obvious that more research is needed there. And, and the questions that Olga was rightly raising about uh, whether or not uh, those people maybe went on to be positive tests or whether or not they were 
they were sort of like real cases or were uh, false positives. We, we, we simply don't have any information on that at the moment. Um, I think it's it was just worth noting that, uh, I mean, we, we felt it was a good process that we went through with the Department of Health here. Um, I think the fact that we called out the process early on publicly and did media around it meant, I think, that they felt obliged to engage with us. There, there wouldn't be high levels of public trust in Northern Ireland uh, in, in our government. I think it would be fair to say, certainly compared to the Republic of Ireland or, or the Scottish government. Um, and I think, therefore, maybe they felt a need to, to get some level of endorsement or buy-in uh, from lots of stakeholder groups, uh, so that may be not, that may well have been an incentive for them. But I think it was worthwhile, and it was a good process that they went through, and I think bodes well for the future, notwithstanding um, some of those outstanding issues. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the, the, I suppose I leave it like that. Um, I think I'm happy to answer questions about the, the process here, um, and it would be really interesting to see further research and further numbers coming out of the, the various apps around these jurisdictions to see whether or not they're truly contributing to a good public health outcome or whether or not it has been a, uh, a sidetrack uh, for, for the public health agencies here. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Patrick. I, I can't remember, I can't recall if you, if, you, if you touched on it, but obviously, Northern Ireland was facing this kind of potential adoption for the centralization how and then opted for a near form the near form development and ultimately um, compatibility with the Republic of Ireland how do you get a sense of how important that compatibility or interoperability between these two systems were for that kind of ultimately political decision about which kind of system to take albeit the centralization model later fell down but when Northern Ireland did choose, it was still in the air. It was kind of seen as quite a significant mark against actually the, the, the development for that, that decision to have been taken. Yes, I mean, I think that uh, a bit of a political head of steam built up then, um, as was when we and others were maybe raising the data privacy questions, but linked to that, the interoperability, the cross-border dimension in particular, and that increasingly got raised in, in our assembly, for instance, as a, as a key marker. And it was obvious, given the direction the Republic of Ireland was going, that the NHS X model wasn't going to meet that test. And therefore, it really did fall to the, the Department of Health. If they were going to try and uh, ensure that cross-border compatibility, they, they almost were obliged to go uh, down the near form of the Republic of Ireland, Google, Apple approach. Even if they even if they weren't convinced on the data privacy arguments uh, that they that they were obliged to to have a model that would work across the border. It just strikes me how significant then I don't know if Olga felt at that time, but the decision of the Republic of Ireland on its model has had this kind of effect on each other on each turn, whether that be um, Northern Ireland's decision or even Scotland's decision as well, particularly even all the way down to the same developers that like one that first mover kind of advantage was quite significant um we don't need to discuss it but it's just a ref I would discuss it immediately it's just a reflection of how significant that kind of early decision by the republic had been um, I think so i think that's key so it kind of it turns to me i'm not going to well i'm going to introduce myself to explain a little bit about scotland um again apologies that no one can see my I have no webcam at the moment, so we'll have to make do with this ghostly appearance. Um, uh, so Scotland adopted the Google Apple exposure notification system as well, and also opted for a near form um, near form as the developers. Um, for a long time, the direction of travel from Scotland was um, unclear. They focus instead much on on standing up a manual contract tracing system. Um, and really, the only commentary we received from the Scottish government about what path they wanted to take um, was that they weren't very interested in adopting an NHS centralisation model. So um, uh, the app ultimately, protect.scot, ultimately launched on the, on the 10th of September. Um, and really, it, the, the notification that it was even in development began in, on July 31st. So it was a relatively quick turnaround. Um, 
um, from, from Scotland's perspective. And I think part of that is due to the fact that there had already been um, an opportunity to view the Republic of Ireland's rollout and the developments there, um, and then similarly to see parts of how Northern Ireland were evolving. Um, and that certainly in our discussions with the Scottish Scottish uh, health officials had, had given them confidence that uh, this application could add um, to the overall measures that were available um, for for Scotland in uh, tracing coronavirus. And I think the whole problem, really taking a step back, has been it's a it's ultimately a communications issue um, in many ways. One because this app is voluntary, you can't mandate people. So you basically need to present the most confident, sure-footed um, uh, uh, launch of, a, of an application that you can, because you want people to download this thing, but um, or you want people to take a measure that, that you think will protect their health, but you're not quite sure whether A, it will protect their health, or B, they will trust you that you're doing the right thing in launching something like this. So the need to kind of be on to basically communicate effectively and clearly about what this is um, was really key. So the way that Scotland kind of presented it, it was an important step. It was a part of a, it was a tool in the fight. It wasn't um, the central point. It wasn't the, it wasn't the core part of the government's response. It was just, it was merely an additional tool. One that is, that can cover quite a lot of ground, ground albeit with all of the underpinnings of potential false negatives that, that we've touched on earlier, but that they felt that needed to be basically, um, if it's to land and to be of use, it needs to basically come out confidently and command the confidence of the Scottish public. And so I see a very similar theme to Patrick's um, remarks about how uh, the Northern Irish government basically saw it as important for them to engage with civil society make sure that um, uh, wider and independent commissioners were um, fully briefed, fully understood, had their questions answered. Um, so we similarly had an opportunity to discuss with the Scottish government health official, officials prior to launch, um, although it was only in the kind of couple of weeks uh, in the lead up to it. But they were very open, um, uh, they were very keen to engage, um, and they wanted to make sure that, that this was something that was um, something that was while not able to always command the confidence of civil society or civil civil liberties groups but one that was not going to come out and be a complete kind of walking disaster um and so for what the government the scottish government could control they have done well the biggest caveat here of course is that this is a google apple exposure notification api protocol um, and so we are this is big tech's world and we are just living in it but some of the moves that Scotland took, um, I think, are quite telling. One was that they had no other purpose for this application than tracing proximity and measuring, attempting to measure proximity. So for those using the Scottish app, there will be no one gets asked to input their, the first part of their postcode. Um, there's no symptom tracker, can't book a test directly from the app. You have to go on and buy it through the pre-existing um, electronic systems. And in a way, going back to that communication problem, that makes it a lot easier to say what this thing does. You can kind of just go out like a, with a sort of Ron Seal idea of like, it just does this. It's, it's not about these other pieces. These other postcodes and other pieces of data are not, um, uh, are not gonna be required for you to, to use this application. Um, and I think that was a, a significant choice um, and, and one that was well made ultimately by, by the Scottish government. It, it, it removed the problem um, from them. There's of course downsides to this. Other people begin to ask how local outbreaks are going, what the prevalence of certain uh, of, of the uh, of the virus in, in other areas are, and while they may not have that granular level of data that comes from being able to get people to input their postcode in the app, um, they're comfortable it seems with this idea of it's there to measure proximity, it's not there to perform our wider health surveillance that, that we need to, to carry out to know you know what's a hot spot what's not um but i think kind of going forward because i'm keen actually and it seems like we may not have lillian edwards to discuss unfortunately so we'll turn to a more open discussion after this the thing 
and it may seem premature given the numbers that we're all facing these days in terms of the, the rise um, of, um, of infections. But one of the pieces that, is, that Scotland, I think, has partially failed on, and, and a lot of the, um, actually all of the governments have, is, is on two things. One is on establishing the use of this application in, in some kind of legislative setting. So while it should be, um, while it's of course should always be voluntary, there were some risks that we could see that perhaps an employer would mandate an employee to have to install the app to, to access um, work, or that people could say you can't come into my cafe unless you have it. And that kind of um, that kind of that kind of policy needed, we think, to be ruled out full throated. And while it is absolutely voluntary and non mandatory, those minister ministerial commitments are not necessarily enough. And so we would have wanted to see something placed in law that would have kind of placed, firmly put in front of, on the front foot that this was a safeguard. And actually, the only the only European country that I know that's done that is the Netherlands, that which in which they're and they're still in development on their primary legislation. The other piece that I think um, I would have we would have liked to see Scotland achieve um, and go further on is on the conditions under which this shuts down. And this goes back into that level of what can you control, particularly when you're in the discussion of using Google and Apple Exposure Notification API. For me, it would have been clearly of value for the our respective governments to say, while we're using this API, this application will only be used for this until this period of time and the conditions under which we determine that it's no longer necessary will be X, Y, and Z. And that'll be made you know, public and it'll be done by the Minister of Health, that kind of thing. But so setting out a framework under which um, these apps no longer become necessary or um, they're, they become, um, yeah, they become kind of, and, and ultimately they no longer become necessary and ultimately the data that's held on them all, um, is deleted um, and there's no longer ever, uh, no longer any matching done. That may seem like a long way off, particularly it seems a long way off right now, um, but I think those conditions were a really key thing to, to th th that we've missed in getting across. Um, um, and from now, I'm really keen to start turning into to the questions and um, thank you to others for encouraging me to do so. Um, if I could ask those who are able to switch on the webcams, I think that'd be Olga and Patrick, um, if they could bring themselves back online to allow for the conversation. Um, that's great, thank you both very much. Um, um, and now, um, just a couple of questions that, that are coming out um, from certain, uh, from, from others. Um, so one from Mark Dunn was um, kind of touching on, again, what Steve, Stephen had said in, uh, at the beginning as well about the level of force that may come from um, being told to, to self-isolate from the apps. Um, it, what we've seen is that there have been relatively handful. It's not really clear how effective these apps have been in actually identifying individuals that needed to be self-isolated. But um, Mark asks, do you see the potential for the app being used to help enforce self-isolation, um, e.g. after international travel? Um, Olga, you'd kind of raise concerns from ICCL's perspective on that kind of interoperability. Clearly, it seems like something that a lot of the governments would want to do. But do you think that there's a potential? And is that potential concerning to ICCL? Um, yeah. So, sorry, is the, is the question, um, is, it, is it possible that it would happen? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I, I wonder, I mean, I'm not sure how that would, I'm not sure how that would work in terms of the app, as in enforcing, um, in terms of enforcing any kind of quarantine um, or self-isolation. Um, I mean, effectively, what happens is that you know, you get a call or you're, you're told that you're notified that, that you were a, a close contact. But like it showed in the example of the school example that I just gave, it, I, don't, I don't think it's as clear cut as someone getting a, a notification and then self isolating. You know, there's a conversation with someone in the HSC, there's, they go through some sort of a process um, and it's, it's then decided what the person should or shouldn't do. Um, 
I know that in Ireland there was a, a situation where people were getting alerts on their phone, but they weren't contact, like they weren't close contact alerts. It was like a logging alert that was coming from the phone operating system and it caused a bit of confusion um, kind of people were tweeting about it and talking about it on social media kind of they were confused as to what they were supposed to do with this alert so, so basically an alert was coming up on their phone it looked very much like a covid contact alert they click on it it would disappear and it turns out you know the hsa hsc has since said that that's just an alert from your phone operating system you could have been in contact someone could have walked by uh, who subsequently tested positive but it's not an alert you don't need to self-isolate so, um, so the answer to the question is I, I, I'm not entirely sure because it, it doesn't seem clear to me that it's it's clear already. So how it would be used to kind of enforce or um, ensure people that, that that people would self isolate? It's not entirely clear to me that that would be successful. And I think I mean given that the that the phones can't be linked to a particular individual. Um, under the current design of the app, mm -hmm. that simply wouldn't be possible. So the only way in which that could could be made real is if on having a uh, an alert that the person then contacts the government, contacts the, the test and tracing agency, and then they have them identified as an individual and, and they're going through normal advice and, and, and all of that. But I don't, the phone at the moment or the app at the moment certainly couldn't be used to check, are they staying within a particular you know, geographic range of their home or whatever. Um, as not to say, that couldn't happen in the future with a, a redesigned app. Um, and I think our recommendation to people then would be to delete it um, unless they were happy to uh, to be monitored in that way uh, as a trade-off perhaps against some other freedoms opening up to them. Uh, but that's certainly not the model at the moment. And the model is certainly the Northern Ireland model that I can speak to is a stripped back, very minimal, uh, function um, uh, app. Um, I think I think we need to be very alert to what other governments in other parts of the world do, and whether or not that inspires our governments to follow suit if they think that is proving efficacious in you know uh, putting a stranglehold on the spread of the virus. Um, you know, all things are possible, and certainly governments uh, can be desperate for what seem to be solutions. Um, our job as rights watchdogs is to is to look on the other side of that and to warn the public um, and to engage with government where they're willing to be engaged with. Hmm. Um, and someone someone also asks um, G Holdcroft um, whether work could be done to see whether there are privacy issues with iPhones. So of course it's already been logged that the Android system has slightly further. Um, Privacy invasive uh, aspects with with its play services being switched on. Um, guess is a question more for Stephen and his research agenda. Um, are you seeing a need to to adopt and focus in on on Apple's development, um, or is there less concern that stems from from that vendor? Uh, no, I, I would be delighted to see somebody take on that work and do it. Um, again, the only reason we hadn't done it is it's just you, we, it, there's a lot of effort involved and it's essentially myself and Doug doing this. Um, and it's something we may get around to, but I would be delighted if somebody else did it. Uh, we're, we're, we're happy to publish uh, help. And I think there are people who've started to look at it, but uh, I'm not aware of any results having been published uh, so far. And in terms of possible concern, yeah, I mean, I, you know, Apple uh, probably, well, it, it would be surprising if Apple are not collecting kind of telemetry. Uh, it may or may not be the case uh, that that is avoidable if you want to run the um, these these apps on an Apple device. Uh, we don't know. Um, but the kind of telemetry Google are collecting, uh, in their minds, I think they, they have lots of good reasons for it uh, that have kind of grown up over time. Um, to do with interacting with many different uh, mobile operators and so on. It's not clear to me that Apple wouldn't have stumbled into the same situation. So I'd be, I'd be as concerned, but I don't have any information as to whether they do much better, much worse, or the same. Hmm. And, and on the Play Services piece, is that just a function of how the Android operating system requi is requires, or is like some kind of bogus 
API coding from 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 Google that that that's led it to have to require play services on? Like, how much do you think of it as a sneaky move or just a unhelpfully necessary move given the engineering that that Google has? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't characterize it as sneaky. I, I think what Google did, remember, I mean, to give them credit, back in kind of April, May, when the initial designs and, and implementation, I presume, was starting, a lot of people were saying these are going to be deployed in two weeks. It's all going to save the world. There was a lot of pressure on those developers, I suspect. And uh, I, I would be sympathetic to the, to the decision they made. However, uh, the decision to integrate it with Google Play services, I think, is privacy unfriendly in their implementation. Google Play Services is uh, it's a thing you can turn off on Android. You can disable it, um, but it, very few people do because you kind of have to know when you need to turn it back on again. So essentially, you need to run Google Play Services if you want to install a new app or get new or get updates to existing apps, and then you can turn it off again. And and most things will continue working. Uh, but the fact is, you, you with these, uh, if you turn, if you disable Google Play Services, it breaks the the exposure notification apps. Right. Um, so Alex Stobart asks, and this obviously requires you to determine whether or not you want to tell us, but would the panel members ever download the application? Do they trust it or can they self-manage their lives and feel better that way? I, I mean, I'm happy to go first. I've, I decided to take, I've downloaded protect.scot. It's on my device. Um, don't go outside that much anyway. So uh, it's kind of more symbolic than anything. Um, but I think part of it is understanding, being able to have kicked the tires as much as we have, um, that led to us feeling, for myself, feeling a little bit more comfortable. But I, if others feel comfortable sharing their experience of their decision whether or not to download the app, I'd be curious. Yeah, I'll come in. I mean, so I was asked that question back in early May when 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 I did some media around it when we were uh, raising concerns around the NHS X map app, for instance. And I said at that stage that no, if uh, if we ended up with that centralized model that was being developed out of London, I wouldn't be downloading it and wouldn't be recommending anybody else to either, unless they were happy to to weigh those uh, risks in the balance. Um, but with the the Northern Ireland app that we've ended up with, um, ironically, uh, my my iPhone is too old and uh, I can't download it. It won't work on it. So that's a whole other uh, that's a whole other issue of digital poverty, maybe. Um, but in terms of my wife has downloaded it and we, we've chatted about it and and i i certainly uh was very happy to give her a green light and we've discussed it with our teenage kids and they have now downloaded the the teenage version or the, the teenage friendly version so uh on its current design i have no big concerns if things change down the line uh that would be another matter mm. Um, I was also asked that same question a number of months ago, and uh, I hadn't downloaded the app, and um, I didn't really intend to download the app. But a number of weeks ago, not that many, maybe two or three weeks ago, I did. I also had deleted Google, or turned off rather, Google Play services, not long after reading um, Stephen or Dr. Farrell and Professor Leeds' um, study. But uh, I did download it there maybe two or three weeks ago, purely for research purposes. <laughs> Um, I can't, I can't, I can't, like it's there, it's on my phone, it doesn't annoy me, it doesn't do anything. I do get the odd kind of red dot coming up saying, you know, the, the latest check-ins or whatever, but I, do I feel safer for it? I don't, but that's just me, you know, um, I, I don't. So I guess, no, I uh, go ahead. sorry, I don't know, are you, are you finished, August, sorry? Oh, sorry, yes, Stephen, go, yeah. Uh, so, so I guess I've downloaded the various of these things from various countries loads of times, um, but not for use, just for testing. Uh, on my own personal phone, it, it doesn't work because I don't use either Android or, or iPhones. Um, I would, if it, I, my approach to this is if you're unhappy with Google tracking you, I would not recommend using it on Android. If you don't care about Google tracking you, then off you go. And I don't really believe that this thing is actually going to be that uh, helpful in the end. So, you know, if it makes you feel better and you don't care about Google tracking you, then it's fine. And I think it has been for me, uh, being an uh, an Apple user, um, having read uh, Dr. Farrell's work pre previously, I kind of realised that I was in a better position in having an Apple device. And that, well, 
while there's no um, evidence to suggest it, and there's also an absence of evidence, I suppose, because there's no research, understanding that there wasn't necessarily that immediate concern about play services or location monitoring being on by default as well, um, I was more comfortable with that. And But that's a kind of distinct piece between like these two totemic uh, developers and the choice that one makes in terms of what device to purchase then determines their like level of comfortability um, um, with with that. And that's a concerning outcome. And then also including Stephen's point that and Patrick's that these are these are not a particularly universal applications. They are they don't work on every operating system and they don't work on every operating systems uh, depending on the age of the operating system that they come from as well. Um, and I think that does have I think that's an important thing to to kind of bear in mind that these have never been silver bullets really. Um, they've always been this kind of piece to a to a, to a puzzle. Um, with a huge amount of caveats attached to it. Um, John Leonard asks whether or not the apps in the four territories are compatible in any way. Um, he says, it seems that you need to download a new app if you cross the border. Is there a privacy danger with shared key servers to allow cross-border compatibility? And if not, why haven't they been put in place yet? Um, from Scotland's perspective, they talked about that there were aims to try and figure out country codes that would allow for interoperability between the different applications. But I think those are pretty nascent from what I understand at the moment. Um, uh, but I'm keen to, to hear from, from others what they've heard on this. So I think the, the integration in between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland is kind of special. They, um, they sync up their backend databases about every two hours and then you, you essentially see the same set of keys in, in either jurisdiction. Um, I guess that could be done in, in with Scotland or, or, the UK or England and Wales as well, but it would require some new action, I suppose. There is at the EU level, uh, there's a bunch of countries working together on a kind of federated model where they'll have a server to which all various countries, or well, six or seven, I think, that are taking part right now, can push their keys uh, and then have them downloaded by the apps in each country. And lastly, we've seen in the United States that there's um, there's about five different states that have different apps, uh, one, in, one of which is actually the, also a near form one, uh, mm -hmm. but where all of those apps are pulling from a single um, repository of keys um, so they, they kind of centralize the sharing of keys. It's not, it's not the, the, the NHS X centralized model kind of thing, but it's, it's just a way of having a single central server um, to avoid that kind of cross-border issue. So I think there's a number of ways to do it. I suspect people will figure out how to make the cross-border thing work okay. I, I think the numbers involved will be tiny. Or the number of useful things that happen will be tiny. In Switzerland, for example, they, did a, they have done, to be fair, some work on trying to figure out is it effective and after a couple of months and about another you know, about a million and a half uh, users, as far as they were able to identify, there's maybe 43 people were only alerted and tested positive because of the app. So the numbers involved in this cross-border stuff, I suspect, will be very small. Olga, Patrick, um, if you want to contribute on that. I don't think give anything really further to add what Stephen has said. Um, mm. I mean, I, I wanted to ask Stephen maybe an extension question. That is, um, is he getting continued cooperation and uh, from the agency, the, the the HSE in the Republic of Ireland, and has he tried to get cooperation out of the public health agency in Northern Ireland around trying to get more information uh, around that cross border dimension? Because obviously, it's a uh, for people, particularly people who live near the border here, uh, it is quite an important issue. And I think uh, I think there's a lot of people in Northern Ireland go to travel uh, across to to London, for instance, every week for work. And so that cross border, that that sort of interoperability dimension, is also important for them. Uh, sure. In terms of cooperation with the HSE, uh, they were really great um, in the early testing we did. They helped us get access to the trams. We were Actually, we, us and their testing people were, were working in parallel for some days. Um, so they were really, really very helpful. Uh, some days they perhaps like us less than others, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, depending what's been in the media or what reports they've produced. Um, and uh, so we haven't actually had any direct contact with, with, with authorities, health authorities in Northern Ireland or Scotland. Or um, We have had some contact with some of the people 
in in England uh, who were working on the kind of underlying technology, but not not with the authorities people. Um, and then lastly, I think you, can, you know again from the the kind of survey work we're doing. Uh, we can tell something about what's going on. For example, that the sync up between uh, the Republic and the North is every two hours, um, and you can kind of pick up on the numbers in both places and so on like that. Uh, uh, I, I would be happy to uh, have more interaction with some of the health authorities, but um, again, we're, we're we're also you know to be to be fair to them, we're we're keen to preserve our approach of just being independently testing stuff and not espousing a solution. So while we have pointed out some issues we see to them. Uh, we don't really get involved trying to help them fix it, so I guess that's a kind of a reason they wouldn't necessarily want to spend too much time chatting with us. But... So we've only got a, a couple of minutes left, um, and now we kind of want to aim towards um, rounding rounding up. Um, I guess so the one the question I kind of like to find out from you all is whether or not, like, what change, if any. Would you like to see going forward? Is there anything left that you still want to to push for, or is this a wait and see situation? Um, um, don't know if anybody wants to venture first. I w I would say that um, from my CCL's perspective, anyway, and again. Going back to Dr. Farrell and Professor Lee's study, they made three very clear recommendations in their study uh, on the gain system. Which we would completely adopt, and they were that you know that there would be user-friendly document documentation made available, um, as to how to make Google Play services behave in as privacy-friendly a way as possible when someone is using one of these apps. Um, the second one would be that Google would implement a quiet mode mechanism that would enable users who do find the Google Play services element um, or the sharing of that data to be problematic to, to easily turn that off. And then the third one is that. The, the, the overall, sorry, the governance of the overall gain system would be revi revisited. And then to add to that, ICCL would, um, like I said earlier, you know, really kind of question the efficacy or the worthiness of the symptom tracker element. Because as I said, it, it's 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 not clear to us how that's effective um, at all. And, and just going back to the European Data Protection Board guidelines that the app should have one purpose and one purpose alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so I guess, good, so go ahead, Patrick, friendly. Okay, very, very quickly. I think simply from our point of view, I mean, I think we are content with the Northern Ireland app. Um, I think I would have more questions over the the app available in England, and as a pity Lillian wasn't able to join us because I think that I think there were some issues highlighted in the media today, for instance, that were affecting the English app. Uh, England uh, in Wales, uh, in Wales app, but that were not uh, present in the Northern Ireland and Scotland apps. So there's obviously a difference in design and approach there uh, that has at least been problematic. So it would be interesting to scrutinise that further. And then simply in terms of the Northern Ireland one, more data, more information about its efficacy um, and the, I suppose the issues we touched on earlier about the, the numbers that it's contacting, the number of people it's identifying and contacting, um, are they being? Would they have been contacted anyway via the, uh, the the manual test and tracing? Is it doing a good job of maybe accelerating that? And every day is important in terms of getting a getting a hold on this. Um, and um, I suppose the, the 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 numbers I cited earlier. So out of you know, we've had four four hundred thousand people downloaded it in the last two months. We've had just under four thousand people contacted. Um, with with notifications and, and requests to self isolate. So is is that a good result or a bad result? At the moment, it's simply uh, a number without context. Mm -hmm. So more sharing of that, and I think that would if it, you know if there's a good news story to tell from a public health agency point of view, they should tell it, and that will encourage a higher take up. Um, uh, so I think that that would be important in the in the months ahead, particularly as we head in now into the autumn and winter period when when numbers are looking very very bad indeed here. Yeah, I guess I'd, in, I'd, I'd echo what, what, what um, Olga and Patrick both said. Um, I, what I would add to that is just repeat something that was said earlier, I think, that uh, I, the thing I would like to see is the definition of when this stuff should be turned off. Um, I'd like to see that kind of made more concrete um, and in, in, in the various jurisdictions. Um, and I think if you, if you came up with a rational kind of uh, description of that, 
it looks to me from the measurements we're doing, there are already countries where you would have passed the threshold where you'd say, this is not working, we should turn it off. That's not true in all regions, uh, but I think there are, there's, there's certainly are regions that we're looking at where it's impossible to see how it could be useful. Um, so, yeah, for example, in, in Italy, they have quite a number of downloads, but only about 5% of the number of uploads they should be seeing. So, and that's been on since June. They should know, you know, those those health authorities that have deployed this stuff should know by now if it works or if it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it should be turned off. And I would like to see more emphasis on what are the thresholds, what are the criteria when we decide that we tried it, it didn't work, and now it's time to move on and, and put resources elsewhere. And I think the related question there, but when we turn it off, um, is when is the pandemic over? Uh, because that's mm -hmm. what we've been told is when we turn it off, when we destroy the data. Um, well, the pandemic may be with us forever um, or for a very long time. It's a similar question we have at the moment uh, in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland about the police deployment of spit hoods uh, in response, supposed response to the coronavirus. And they've said it's an emergency measure uh, while police officers are facing coronavirus. Well, when, when is that emergency over? We simply don't know that. And I think that's a longer term question that obviously wasn't faced up to in the haste of, of deploying, uh, but we now need to address. Yeah, I think that's right from, from our perspective as well. It's um, it's certainly about, well, it feels like we're in the middle of something. There absolutely has to be some view to what this looks like at the end um, and articulating that. Um, so. So yeah, I mean, these things should be temporary measures, right? And so we need to understand what that temporary measure looks like. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna let you all go back off to figuring out what those temporary measures are and continue to push on this. Thank you so much for your time. Um, to the audience, thank you very much for your, your great questions. I'm sorry we were not able to get to, to everyone's, I'm also sorry that my webcam wasn't working, but um, thank you for bearing with us. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists, Olga, uh, Cronin, Patrick Corrigan, Dr. Stephen Farrell. Um, yeah, Open Rights Group will continue to be doing these um, over the coming weeks with a little bit more competency, perhaps. Um, but uh, stay safe out there um, and keep well. Thank you all very much. Have a good uh, weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.